the Emerald Isle has children all over the world. Mainly, millions of people in the UK and the USA whose ancestors emigrated in the late 19th century. I am English, but I have some Irish ancestors too. In this film I will discover a castle they used to live in, but first I will explain the entire ancient history of Ireland from the Neolithic to the Viking Age. Get ready for a good crack, my lads. Our journey starts in the famous Valley of the Boyne, a river named after a Celtic goddess, Boan, whose name means White Cow. And she was the mother of a god of youthful male virility named Angus, who, Celtic folklore holds, was buried in the Neolithic tomb called New Grange. The valley has several extraordinary Neolithic chambered tombs, including this one called Douth. No doubt the most famous though, and certainly one of the most important Neolithic monuments in the entire world, is New Grange. It predates the Celts, to whom it just appeared like any burial mound, by thousands of years. At 5,200 years old, it is among the oldest and most magnificent structures of the megalith culture which spread out from northwest France over the Neolithic along with a people who had their origins in Anatolia. They were the first farmers in Britain and Ireland. Early construction at Stonehenge began a couple of hundred years after New Grange. The same Neolithic race built all the stone circles in the British Isles, including the standing stones of Stenness, which are roughly contemporary with New Grange, and the Ring of Brodgar, both in the Orkney Islands, north of Scotland, which I visited 10 years ago. Please excuse the shaky old footage. They are adjacent to a passage tomb of the same type as New Grange, called Mace Howe. This tomb is aligned to the winter solstice, so that its interior is illuminated by the sun on just one day of the year, exactly the same as at New Grange, which is over 380 miles away. New Grange's unique white quartz facade is a somewhat controversial modern reconstruction using all the stones that were found on site. They were imported from 30 miles away and are not there by mistake, but we can't really know how they were employed in the original tomb. The monument is skirted by huge stones, and those at the rear and the front of the tomb are decorated with beautifully preserved Neolithic artwork. We can speculate what their spiral shapes meant, but we can be sure these have nothing to do with Celtic artwork of later millennia, as I will explain later. Similar spiral shapes are found on the interior of other Irish passage tombs, both in the passages and in the tombs themselves and New Grange is no exception. These megalithic people had no metal. They worked only with bone, wood and rocks. These spherical stones are found in Irish Neolithic tombs, but we don't know what they are. Is this for measuring depth, or is it a religious item? The answers died with the race that made them. In Dublin, we can find some answers as to what happened to the Neolithic Irish. Here at the National Museum of Archaeology, is a beautiful and impressive collection of early gold and bronze work created by the race which replaced the previous inhabitants of Britain and Ireland about four and a half thousand years ago. Archaeologists call their culture the Bell Beaker culture and it spans from the end of the Neolithic right into the Bronze Age. These people are the ancestors of the modern Irish people, but they were not Celts yet. Most of them entered Britain from Holland and soon after spread into Ireland. All of northwestern Europe from Holland to Ireland was genetically and culturally 
fairly homogeneous in the Bronze Age, and it is likely they all spoke the same Indo-European language and were culturally related to the Celts of the Iron Age. They had an Indo-European, patriarchal and solar culture too. These sun wheels were sewn onto their clothing. The exact same things show up in England too from the same time. The Beaker folk introduced the skill of goldsmithing to the British Isles, and they clearly regarded gold as a sacred substance. It was a male-dominated culture in which women were married off to other tribes, but some women had high social status, which is reflected in their impressive gold jewellery, like these earrings. These gold spheres from a necklace. Or these amber bead necklaces, which were imported from the Baltic most likely Denmark. And most of these things are found in Britain too, but about 80% of the gold lunula, like these, that have been discovered, all came from Ireland, so there was obviously already a regional culture developing here. The Irish Belbeaker people exported their gold to Britain, but they also imported gold from Cornwall. But we don't really understand why. Their ideas of value and currency were completely alien to ours. The late Bronze Age goldwork gets more advanced and demonstrates greater technical skill. Bronze weapons hordes also became more common, reflecting the martial and warlike culture of the Bronze Age Irish. at least a 90% population replacement of the Neolithic people by the Belbeaker folk, there was still some cultural continuity in Ireland. Few things illustrate this continuity as clearly as the archaeological complex at the Hill of Tara, which has remained mythologically significant throughout the Celtic and medieval times and is still special for modern Irish people. Many of the mounds here date back to the Neolithic but the myths surrounding the monuments all relate to Iron Age beliefs and Celtic gods recorded in medieval literature. One such Neolithic passage tomb is known as the Mound of the Hostages, which is like a mini New Grange. It is aligned to the sunrise on Sarwen, which indicates the Irish Celtic calendar was in fact based, at least in part, on pre-Celtic Irish beliefs from the Neolithic. The tomb is named after the mythic Iron Age High King of Ireland, Nile of the Nine Hostages, who took members of other royal families hostage, which is very Indo-European. But archaeologically, the tomb was not used much in the Iron Age, in fact. We do find stone and bone items from the Neolithic people who built it, and then later evidence of the Indo-European invaders, the Belbica people, interring both funerary urns and also entire bodies of hundreds of people all through the Bronze Age, showing they had fully appropriated this religious and funerary monument of the previous inhabitants of Ireland. This very Indo-European early Belbica stone axe was found inside the Mound of the Hostages. Many of the megalithic tombs 
despite having been damaged during the passage of time, were reused for Belbica burials. This practice, which was quite frequent in the megalithic tombs of Iberia, has been interpreted as an attempt of the incipient beaker elites to legitimate their position. In order to do so, they would have created a fictitious genealogy to link themselves to the sacred lineage of the ancestors. Near to the mound is this phallic stone, which many believe is the legendary Leofol, or Stone of Destiny, which was used as an inauguration stone for the Celtic kings of Ireland. The Celts believed it was put here by their gods, the Tuar de Danann. However, it originally stood at the entrance of the Mound of the Hostages until it was moved in Victorian times. All about the Hill of Tara, we see evidence of the enduring pagan beliefs that persist among modern Irish people. Votive offerings and ribbons called clouties are tied to the surrounding trees which are held as sacred due to their proximity to this ancient place. Not all of the secrets of Ireland's past are in burial mounds. Some lurk in the depths of the dank and stinking bogs. Bog offerings and burials first occurred in Denmark during the Stone Age. Uh, they increase in frequency during the Bronze Age. But in the Iron Age, when Celtic culture arrived in Ireland, we start to see bog bodies and offerings here too. But we shouldn't assume this is the same ritual as in Iron Age England and Denmark. This is Old Croan Man, discovered in 2003. He died between 362 and 175 BC. His nipples had been mutilated before he was killed. St. Patrick related that the Celtic pagans of Ireland had to suck the king's nipples as an act of fealty. And this reveals that the nipples of the king were an important aspect of Irish kingship, and so mutilation of them would be a way of de-consecrating a formerly sacred king. This is the theory espoused by Eamon Kelly, a former keeper of antiquities at this national museum. This is Clonny Caven Man, and his nipples were also mutilated. Kelly relates this to the perennial Indo-European concept of the Hieros Gamos, or sacred marriage between a sky god and an earth mother in many religions, which is reflected in the right of Indo-European kingship, where the king's right to rule is predicated on his marriage to the land itself, which his just rule would ensure was fruitful and would bring prosperity to its people. If harvests failed, or the cattle got sick, the king would take some of the blame, and he might end up in a bog with his nipples cut to bits. However, it isn't just Celtic bodies we find in Irish bogs. This is Ralagan Man, an idol made from yew wood, almost certainly a god, dating to the late Bronze Age. It is very hard to tell if this represents an enduring custom of the Belbeaker people, or a new custom from the first Celts in Ireland, because the custom of making such idols and leaving them in box actually dates back to Ice Age Russia, and is very persistent. I mean, this one was found in the marshes of East London, and is made of Scots pine, and dates to the time the Belbeaker people first arrived in Britain. The hole was used to insert a penis which is lost, and many of these idols have emphasised male or female genitalia. And these ones came from East Yorkshire, and date to roughly the time the Celts first arrived, around 600 BC, so they must be Celtic? This is Brodenbjerg idol, it was found in Denmark, and is widely regarded as relating to the cult of the Germanic god Ingwifrey due to its phallus.
These oak idols from North Germany are associated with the Iron Age Germanic religion too. However, other bog idols are associated with the early Celts of Germany's Hallstatt culture. Evidently, the early Celtic and Germanic religions had a lot in common. This is an enormous lump of bog butter. Bogs in Denmark and Ireland were once used to preserve butter since there is no oxygen in the bog and therefore bacteria can't make it go rotten. So we don't really know if this butter was an offering to the gods or if someone just forgot where they left it. It was kept inside this churn. first Celts arrived in Ireland from Britain sometime at the start of the Iron Age, around 700 BC. They had their origins in the Unyachisia culture of Central Europe, which evolved into the Hallstatt and then Latin cultures. I made a whole video on the origin of the Celts already if you want to learn more about that. There wasn't a massive population replacement in Ireland like there was with the Beaker people 2000 years earlier but Irish people all started speaking a new Celtic language, perhaps enforced by a new foreign elite. The Celts brought the Iron Age to Ireland, but bronze was still in use too. This is a Celtic bronze hoard from Ireland. These look a bit like hand grenades. Were they made by the Proto-IRA? Religion in Ireland changed and synchronized with Celtic customs from Britain and the continent. This multi-faced stone head from County Cavan represents a multifaceted god. Gods are depicted with multiple faces in many Indo-European religions, such as Svetovit of the Slavs, Janus of the Romans, and many Hindu gods. The stone head resembles many others found in Celtic Britain and France. The torque is also a clear sign of Celtic culture. Gold remained important in Celtic Ireland, and this torque would have been a symbol of power, just as they were for Celts on the continent. This Irish sword pommel with a head also looks just like others found in Gaul. This ritual instrument, decorated with Latin style art, closely resembles the lures of the Nordic Bronze Age and may reflect enduring cultural exchange not only with Celtic Central Europe but also with Scandinavia. This gold boat was part of the Breuter Hoard. It may have been a votive deposit to the Celtic sea god Mananan. Christianity reached Ireland about the time of the fall of the Roman Empire. Conversion was relatively peaceful compared to other parts of Northern Europe, which seems to have aided in the preservation of pre-Christian Irish legends, which were integrated with the new faith, where pagan deities like Bridget were made into saints. The Irish were converted by missionaries from Britain, but when pagan Anglo-Saxons took over England, it was the Irish missionaries who helped to convert them and we can see Irish influence on these Anglo-Saxon manuscripts as a result. But 400 years after the first Irish people converted to Christianity, Indo-European religion returned to the Emerald Isle. In the late 8th century, Vikings started raiding monasteries on the coasts of Britain and Ireland. They hit Lindisfarne in England in 793. The Irish island of Rathlin was burned by the Vikings two years later. The Vikings were Scandinavians who had preserved their ancestral pagan religion and still offered up sacrifices to idols of the old gods. They soon came to Ireland in greater numbers with up to 100 boats at a time and didn't go home after raiding, but set up new coastal towns like Dublin and Cork. 
they gradually mixed with the native Irish to form a new ethnic group, the Hiberno-Norse, who had a significant influence on the country. The Hiberno-Norse influenced the Christian art of Ireland. The style of knotwork on this Irish crozier is not Celtic. This is the late Norse Ringerike style. And this silver brooch from Rathlin Island is clearly influenced by Viking style brooches. Even this holy reliquary box has pagan Norse style knotwork on it. The next people to invade Ireland after the Vikings were the Anglo Normans in the 12th century. The Gaelic kings were replaced by Norman rulers like Richard Latuit, who arrived in Ireland with Henry II and whose descendants became the barons of fertile lands in West Meath. The Normans remained the aristocracy in Ireland until the 17th century, when the Williamite Wars resulted in many Anglo-Norman families who had been loyal to James II being replaced by Protestants, such as newcomers like my ancestor, the Derbyshire-born lawyer Richard Levinge, who was appointed Irish Solicitor General and Speaker of the House of Commons. He later became Attorney General and Lord Chief Justice as a reward for his services. In 1704, he received a baronetcy and duly became Sir Richard Levinge. He acquired the lands of the Anglo-Norman Tweet family in Westmeath and built a mansion there near the ruins of an old Norman castle. But 100 years later, his great-great-grandson, also named Richard, commissioned a castle of their own with the Levinge crest on the front gate. Built in faux medieval Gothic style, it was intended to bestow the Anglo-Saxon family with the same historic links to the past that their Norman predecessors had held. It's really appropriate that the castle looks so spooky today because the records from the National Folklore Collection at University College Dublin reveal that the local people knew of ghosts from this castle, who were my blood relatives. These ghosts came from Sir Richard Levinge's mother's family, the Raynells, an Anglo-Norman family of barons in Ireland who originated in Devon, and whom I also descend from through Dame Eliza Levinge. But the descriptions the common folk give of the supernatural creatures that dwelled on my ancestors' land aren't just ghosts they have a distinctly ancient and Indo-European quality. Long ago in Killinan, it was said that coaches drove up and down the avenue, and all the house was lit up with a ghost. The priest of the parish put away the ghost, and there's a room in the house that cannot be opened. It could not be opened because the ants of Mr. Reynold appeared in it. They all died at 18 years of age, there was a ghost seen in Nocturne Avenues, running through the wood. He was called the Becca Down. It was supposed to have a foal's head and a man's body. And the noise he made was like a man laughing. Mrs. M. Colfer of Fairmount Edwardstown told me that at Nocturn Castle near Mullingar County, Westmeath, where a family of the Levanges live, when a person of the family is going to die, a big animal resembling a horse is seen, put with horns on it. It has been seen several times, and each time it has been seen, a person in the family has died. Long ago, Fairies lived in a fort near past crossroads. Every night the fairies would go down a laneway which leads to Nocturne. At midnight they would have a chariot drawn without horses. They would go up and down the lane a lot of times. There was a house built on their path. One night the man that lived in the house was sick and he had two women minding him. At twelve o'clock 
the latch stirred and the two women were afraid and the voice said you are not brave soldiers Here in Dublin, some beautiful old Celtic style gravestones, behind which lie the graves of some of my ancestors. Two of my ancestors over there, side by side, my great aunt next to them over there, and here, along here, some of my cousins from the Lavange family who lived in Castle Nocturne, as did some of my Lavange ancestors. The ones who are my ancestors here are the Miller family, um, Colonel Miller of the Irish Constabulary who married Francis Lavange from Castle Nocturne. Of course, I missed some important parts of Irish history, like the famine and the troubles, but this channel is focused on ancient religion, genetics and folklore, so you'll have to look somewhere else for that information. If you want to learn more about the Celts or the Bell Beaker folk, then the good news is I have other videos about them which you ought to watch. You can also access exclusive private videos which I make just for patrons if you sign up for either Patreon or Subscribestar for as little as the price of a pint per month. The links for these are in the description. If you support me, you will be ensuring this channel continues to survive and celebrate ancient European history for years to come. So thank you so much.